Good evening and uh, welcome to The Late Show. Today is uh, Wednesday the 22nd of July and uh, in this programme today we'll be marking the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Britain that took place above our very skies right now where the nation of, uh, of Great Britain was in peril with the Nazi threat. The uh, Germans had already um, conquered the whole Low Countries, uh, including Holland, Belgium. We had the British Expeditionary Force had to flee to the small coastal town of Dunkirk, in which uh, we saw God's intervention and a miraculous deliverance of over 340,000 men, British and French, surrounded by Nazi enemy forces. And then in June, we saw the collapse of, the, uh, of, of France to the Nazis, and then Hitler turned his attention to Britain in what was codenamed Operation Sea Lion. But in order to accomplish his uh, plan to invade Britain, the uh, German Luftwaffe had to take air superiority and had to defeat the RAF. And uh, this is where some of the most courageous battles took place over these islands 80 years ago. Um, and we are live and interactive, so I'd love to know your views and your comments and any memories you have of your parents or of the Battle of Britain or any of you who have actually served in the REF would love to hear from you. Um, Reagan, this is um, yeah, a any, any excuse for me to do a program and show videos that features Spitfires. Uh, Absolutely. Um, I just, I just love that opportunity. But, you know, as we, we reflect, this is an important time. I, I've just been thinking about this um, prior to the programme. Why it's important to remember these events. Um, and we know that the Battle of Britain first started in uh, July of 1940 and then didn't actually finish till sometime after the 15th of September, even early October of 1940. Um, and the, the, the intensity of this battle was, was immense. Um, and, and that's why I think it's also important that we remember because we need not only to honour uh, the bravery and the courage shown by those RAF pilots, but also for those who prayed and interceded for our nation at this time. Because mm. had the Luftwaffe uh, defeated the RAF, then we all, almost certainly would have faced a, a, a land invasion by the Nazis. Absolutely. The goal was to completely clear um, Britain's skies. And the Luftwaffe was designed, it had basically come onto the scene with that particular intent to completely destroy every single element of the RAF. And pinning, um, clearing the skies, you would have that mass land invasion that would have in all likelihood seen the fall of Britain as well um, to the Nazis. The Battle of Britain is incredible in that you, you actually see a situation where the Luftwaffe is uh, the most powerful air force of its day. There were a couple of thousand uh, aircraft in its squadron and uh, by the end of the Battle of Britain I believe you would see about 1700 uh, Luftwaffe um, planes had been destroyed. Um, I believe that there were only 749 fighters in the RAF uh, at the start of the Battle of Britain. You would see in the course of the battle uh, about 544, I believe, young, young pilots lose their lives. Average age, 20 years old. So f for the viewers, just to, to think through that for a moment, uh, just picture one of those 20-year-olds that you know uh, suiting up, getting two weeks of training in uh, a fighter um, plane, going out, risking life, sacrificing for the nation. Would we see that today? I, I hope we would. I hope if we were to encounter some similar threat that we would see that. But, Simon, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I mean, what, what do you think? Do you think that... It's a different generation. I, 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 mm. and one thing impressed me about the uh, the Second World War generation, and um, I went to I was in Washington D.C. in about '99, um, and uh, I went to the they just opened up the uh, World War II memorial um, on what's known as the um, the Washington Mall. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bill Clinton was there. He was president. Uh, he gave uh, he gave a speech, and. 
One thing struck me so much is that they didn't want to be called heroes. Right. They felt kind of ashamed that there was actually a statue um, dedicated to uh, those American veterans who served during the Second World War because they felt that they would do any... This is just ordinary. We were just called to do what we had to do. Uh, and that's what makes that generation so special. They just got on with it. We did our um, duty. They did our duty. They realised that uh, our Western freedoms were at peril mm -hmm. and they wanted to fight. I mean, people actually committed suicide because they, they couldn't actually um, be enlisted to join the, the military forces because of the shame that was actually then the social stigma attached to that. So it just shows you, I, I think it's a completely different generation um, to the one we have now and, and, and my generation, um, because there's also a sense of not only moral authority and compass, they, they all had an understanding uh, of God. And if you watch the film, which is um, Fury, uh, yes. which, which is an interesting film about uh, the uh, tank commanders. Um, one of the, as the American tanks um, go into Germany um, and they have a new crew and uh, one of them says, well, you better believe in God. You better know what you believe in because mm. you won't live long. Mm. So there's that concept of, of thinking about our role in this, uh, where we're going afterwards. Uh, and the afterlife. And these are thoughts that I think only COVID-19 has actually brought up in people's minds a little bit. The crisis, where do we go off, after, after death? What happens after death? And these are questions when everything's going well, when the money's rolling in, um, you don't ask those questions. Yeah. So I, I think that was very, very poignant. And, and the fact is that, uh, you know, the, the RAF had distinguished itself. Now, I think the key, key element in this was the RAF developing um, uh, radar. Um, and it was the radar that, they give, that gave the British that little bit of advantage mm. to identify where the Luftwaffe was flying over so the Spitfires and Hurricanes could meet them in the air and, and take them on in combat. Without that, I, I think the Germans would have won air superiority without a question. They, they vastly outnumbered. Oh, yeah. RAF planes? Uh, 2,550 Luftwaffe aircraft Incredible. compared to the RAF's uh, 749 fighters. Yeah, it's so, almost biblical odds. Yeah, they they, sh they should have won. The Luftwaffe should have won. Highly trained. A lot of the guys in the Battle RAF. hardened as well. Absolutely. And you, you have a lot of these guys in the RAF, they had only been trained for two weeks. 20-year-olds who may have not even sat in a plane for more than two weeks prior to this battle. Just phenomenal. You, it's something that it's hard to wrap our heads around. I think by this point in the war, the nation was well and truly um, behind the fighters. By this point, I think the whole nation seems to have grasped the seriousness of the situation. You remember that back in the 30s, there had been this consistent policy of appeasement. Absolutely. It's actually what allowed Nazi Germany to spread across Europe uh, without r really any hindrance. And so finally, having taken France, it, it hits home. By Dunkirk, it, it hit home. Our troops are threatened. The uh, Third Reich does not desire peace. It will um, take over all of civilization as we know it. Churchill uh, particularly spoke of how after Britain, um, it, it would not lower its sights and refuse to go across the Atlantic to the United States. The whole of civilization as we know it would have been completely transformed. Um, also, you'll know that the, um, the Third Reich had set up this alliance of sorts and, and axis those axis of evil uh, sometimes where you had Nazi Germany in alliance with uh, Italy. So there was um, out of Berlin, in Nazi Germany, then you had Rome, and then Tokyo, uh, where Japan was also spreading its interests. And between the three, there was this resolve to fight um, the influence that was coming out of Soviet um, Russia and a resolve basically to not impede one another's progress Absolutely. as well. And the Soviets were on board with the Nazis at the beginning. Yeah. At the uh, Nazi-Soviet pact at the beginning. Um, I just want to read this out because uh, this, I mean, 
Reagan has very much set the scene there of what it was like in Britain in the summer of 1940. But I just want to read out this quote from Winston Churchill, uh, who made this, in, uh, uh, spoke in the House of Commons on the 18th of June, 1940, and gave one of his, his most famous speeches in which he prepared the British countrymen for the challenges that lay ahead. And this is what he said. He said, what General Weygand called the Battle of France is over. I expect that the Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilizations. Uh, upon it depends our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that we ha they ha will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all of Europe may be free and the life of the world may move forward into a broad sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age, made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted science. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will say that this was their finest hour. Mm. Um, I mean, with a, with a Prime Minister like Winston Churchill, um, and to be able to be an orator like that and to communicate uh, and inspire uh, a nation. Um, absolutely incredible. So there is no doubt that everyone knew what was at stake because the war had finally come home to Britain, mm. in the Battle of Britain. And what's also really amazing about this is that you had the RAF, but there were quite a few displaced from their own homelands due to the spread um, of the Nazi empire, essentially, and these joined forces and played an incremental part in this battle, recognizing that, that Britain, if it was preserved, it could go on to push back against the Nazi threat. Uh, eventually, the United States would come on board. It was still, really, by the time of, um, of Dunkirk, um, was still a bit uncertain as to where it stood in all of this. It was still really striving for peace. It was backing a policy of appeasement more so. It wasn't really wanting to get involved. But what we begin to see is following the Battle of Britain, um, with the Luftwaffe being um, more or less decimated in its power, um, a growing sense that there's more at work here than numbers. If we look particularly to what happened at Dunkirk, we know that um, God was in control. We know that, that God was using all of these uh, events um, for our good and his glory. And there were days of prayer. Absolutely. People were you know, re really experiencing spiritual awakening in, in some degree, I believe. Absolutely. Right, just got a few uh, text messages and email. This is good. So, well done for giving uh, the credit to God. When COVID uh, started, some called it our generation's war. But uh, how can we expect victory when we despise our creator and redeemer? And that's from Katie. I completely agree oh, with you, Katie, crazy. on that one. So, thank you for that one. This one says, uh, thank you for tonight's program on the Battle of Britain. I was nearly six years old. We just lived on the south of Crawley on a farm. I remember being with my mum, picking blackberries, and there were planes overhead shooting at each other. Uh, spent bullets were falling down, and we dived into the adjourning woodland and took shelter amongst the sweet chestnut trees. That's from John. So that's a brilliant mm. email. So thank you. I mean, uh, you're very special because you are part of that uh, Second World War generation and, and can remember that and what different world we're living in now. But let's have a look now at this um, inspirational video which is entitled Battle of Britain 80th anniversary 112 days to victory and it just puts everything into perspective
Battle of France is over. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free, and the life of the world may move forward into broad, sunless uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age. His was one of 10 Spitfires that attacked 24 109s, protecting a force of Heinkel bombers. He closed to within 50 yards of one of the agile, single-engine German fighters, firing into its fuselage from tail to cockpit. It rolled onto its back, issuing white smoke, and started to nose down. But fire from other aircraft forced Lorry to pull away, so he never saw it crash. They that have climbed the white mists of morning, they that have soared before the world's awake, to herald up their foemen to them scorning. The thin dawn's rest their weary folk might take. Some that have left other mouths to tell the story of high blue battle, white young limbs that bled. How they thundered up the clouds to glory or fallen to an English field stained red oh i have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on the laughter silvered wings sunward i've climbed and joined the tumbling Clouds, the sun, and the moon, the moon, the moon, the 
Uh, for me, that was extremely inspirational. I have an absolute passion for Spitfires, as my wife can tell you. Um, I, and that's why I just love showing that, because something about that iconic plane, uh, that Merlin engine war, and, and sometimes you, you, you can be outside and sometimes hear a Spitfire going, and you can hear it from, um, uh, from quite far off. Yeah. But it's that sound and then seeing those iconic wings um, Beautiful. I, I've got a love affair with the Spitfire. Just, just watching uh, that is chill, chills, really. It's <laughs> fabulous, fabulous. Phenomenal. And, and at home, I've got um, the when I've been recording politics today, I've got I had a backdrop of uh, Spitfires flying over France for the D-Day breakout in uh, 1944, signed by some of the squadron leaders and. RAF pilots who took part in uh, the liberation of France during D-Day. So for me, it's very special. I may even remember of an early age, there's pictures of me as a three-year-old when parents gave me with a little matchstick Spitfire. So mm. I've had them and the house is full of them. Wonderful. Um, so <laughs> so it's, it's, it's something because it, it, what for me that symbolises is it symbolises it symbolises freedom. Yeah. And that aircraft is one of the iconic symbols of the Second World War, in which we owe our freedom now to those brave and courageous men who sacrificed their lives for what we have today, particularly knowing how demonic and evil uh, the Nazi regime actually mm. was, uh, and its perverse ideology of, uh, uh, beyond perverse ideology, uh, of actually wanting to wipe out the entire Jewish race, uh, the ideology of the Aryan, um, of, of anti-Semitism being at the very heart mm. of the regime's ideology, its desire to destroy Christianity and, and replace it with a kind of uh, paganism was the whole intention. Um, and, you know, this is when the world faced an unprecedented evil, something I think we will only see a glimpse again uh, actually during the tribulation period itself. If you look at even the, the brevity at which this was established, 1936 is when the RAF um, fighter command was established. So four years, just four oh. years and you're already engaged in mass battle. Now we, we talked a bit about how the Luftwaffe had vastly outnumbered um, the RAF in terms of its squadron. And yet the RAF in that time had actually developed where it was the most um, technologically advanced, the most technologically advanced um, f fighter squadron that was around. So that's incredibly, uh, to think about four years of development. The Luftwaffe, remember, after World War I, Germany was not able um, to have uh, a fighter. They weren't able to have any aircraft at all. Yeah. yeah. But they obviously reformed. They had this mass, uh, this in mass grouping, this in mass squadron that's aiming to clear Britain's skies. Here you have fewer but more advanced planes, uh, less trained pilots, but they had drive. They had a spirit of sacrifice and they had a, a desire that wasn't so much uh, about gaining ground. Because remember, Nazi Germany had taken over all of Europe. Here, these men were desperate to fight for Britain and for, as, as Churchill said, civilization as we know it, Christian civilization as we know it, which is important. There was a distinction that Churchill was making there. And, for the viewers, you may encounter occasionally um, people will say, well, what, what, what about Hitler? Um, didn't he like claim to be a Christian or something? And you know, th there are different facets of that that you can analyze. But the fundamental tenets of um, the um, Nazi, Nazism essentially are anti-Christ. Hitler himself put himself in a place of power and control over the churches in Germany. And so you, you had an underground church movement um, that was, was thriving, but that was also um, part and parcel of resistance movement. So look at Dietrich Bonhoeffer, people like that who were involved in um, a great way in, in some way in resisting the spread of um, Nazism uh, across Europe. 
uh, absolutely. from within Germany. Absolutely. Uh, and the SS was, uh, obs they were obsessed with the, with the occult. Yeah. Um, and, and that's absolutely. absolutely obsessed with it. I mean, even Hitler, for example, when he gave his speeches, this um, demonic influence would come over him. And then afterwards, he would just be absolutely shattered and, and mm. just absolutely shaking and nothing left of him. So there's something that he opened himself up to um, mm. that allowed Satan to, to enter into him, to do what he did, to give him the power that he had as well. And the symbol uh, of the swastika as well is um, an ancient pagan symbol. Um, and so to adopt that as your, as your key emblem. Absolutely. Right, I've got a few more emails, which is uh, fantastic. So uh, this one is, hi, Simon uh, and uh, Reagan. Uh, Belfast was bombed regularly by the Luftwaffe. My question is, Belfast's geographically location would have meant that the Nazis would have had to fight their way here, or were they given right of way by the Republic of Ireland um, to blitz Belfast after all de Vieira, the Irish Prime Minister at the time, did send condolences when he heard of the death of Hitler to Germany, and that's uh, Frankie in uh, Belfast. Um, yeah, because the Republic of Ireland w was neutral, but also what's so interesting is uh, uh, back in 2006, I uh, visited uh, Dublin, went outside of Dublin and saw this Second World War grave, uh, and it, it was actually a German grave of German fighter pilots, and next to it you had the German flags next to the Irish flags. So, mm. um, and also the, the hatred in the Republic of Ireland towards Britain and, and everything else, you know, I, I, I think uh, maybe the, uh, the Irish would have then also given Germany the opportunity then to, to land their forces in Ireland. Who knows? Who knows? We, we can't really answer that because history doesn't give us that indication. Uh, this one says, uh, 80 years is the length of a generation according to Psalms. And when Israel won its war of independence in uh, March of 49, it birthed a nation after nine months of labor, a generation from then. Jesus will return in uh, 2029. With scripture say, no one knows the day nor the hour. Um, so it's a bit dangerous to, yeah. uh, to speculate. Um, but I mean, if we take ourselves back, um, before it was only really the British troops or the British Expeditionary Force fighting an intense battle against the advancing uh, German Blitzkrieg um, in Belgium and in France, realised the true threat that uh, the Nazis posed. But this battle brought everything closer because, uh, as we say, one of our viewers actually remembers seeing kind of dogfights in the sky, uh, and particularly those living in the south of England, living in London, uh, would have seen the battle taking place over their very eyes, and also the bombing raids that the Luftwaffe carried out on our major cities such as uh, London and, and Manchester and Birmingham, all on industrial heartlands. The war then came home in mm. the summer of 1940 and the sacrifice that was made by ordinary civilians trying to do everything they could for the war effort knowing also that they were involved in this war which was very very different from the uh, the first world war absolutely I, I would be curious if any of the viewers even uh, i believe you read one um, earlier ago that you you referenced where there was a witnessing of um, a, a dogfight basically uh, I would be curious to know how the Battle of Britain changed daily life, how it changed um, people's daily interactions. Um, did life go on as normal? Were people in some way trying to make the best of a bad deal? Uh, how, how was it like in the countryside? Did, uh, was there a sense of some distance from uh, the Blitz that had ravaged London? Or was there very much a sense of our nation is at war, we are under attack, we are in danger? Was there some fear of losing freedom? What exactly was going through um, your mind or what, what have you heard was going through your family's mind at that time? I would be really keen to hear some of those thoughts. Yeah, I'm just going to read out a couple of emails. This one's a slightly long one. Uh, said, uh, good evening, Simon and Reagan. Many thanks for covering such a pivotal moment in our nation's history and for Winston Churchill's memorable quote. Uh, he also went on to say, never in the field of human mm. conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. That was my closing statement. Um, so Still you beat me to it. One. Uh, this one <laughs> says, as an aviator myself, I am in awe at the courage and commitment and sacrifice 
sacrifice of those young pilots mm. who turned the fortunes of the nation around for good. Not to negotiate um, in any way. This greater love has no man than laying down their lives. It's right to mention the massive commitment uh, to prayer in the nation must have been critical. Recently, the BBC covered the untold story of a 13-year-old Hazel Hill remember this amazing story, and her crucial role in the design of the famous Spitfire and Hurricane fighter planes in the run-up to the Battle of Britain. Uh, as a brilliant mathematician, she helped her father do all the necessary calculations to put eight guns rather than four on the Spitfire and Hurricanes. Amazing story. All this all very close to my heart as my father was in the Air Gunnery Instructor Flight Sergeant on Lancaster Bombers. And that's blessings and love from Leslie and Marianne in Cheltenham. Ah, it's with you two. know you very well. Um, no, that's really incredible. And this is what I love about the, these old stories. And I, I, my generation kind of grew up with my grandparents sharing stories about the Second World War. And there was always that stigma with my generation. Oh, they're not talking about the war again, are they? And when you think how many few veterans there are left of the Second World War, um, how much I would cherish those conversations now. Uh, as a kid member them, but, but how much I would cherish more to actually have the conversations with my grandparents about what they went through, um, particularly my grandfather who, who fought uh, a very tough campaign uh, mm. across Europe and across the Middle East um, in Italy as well. And, and to have that experience of what it was like um, must have been horrendous because anyone of fighting age had to go out and serve and fight. And, uh, you know, you didn't know when was going to be your last day. Um, particularly those in the sky, mm. those uh, brave and courageous young pilots you mentioned at the beginning of the program. You know, their, their average flying time or missions would only sometimes be four or five missions um, because of the intensity of that battle. I mean, you can imagine it. You have the sirens go off. You have to go and meet the Luftwaffe. You take them on. You, you're war weary. You're shattered. You come out a little break and then the, the bell goes and you have to fly again. Um, just absolutely um, incredible endurance and, and passion showed by those brave and courageous men. But also got to play the incredible role that the, the women played in the mapping rooms with mm. the radar <laughs> to identify where the Luftwaffe was flying over, the concentration needed um, to get all the coordinates in place so then that uh, the uh, Hurricanes and the Spitfires could actually meet them head on. Also, in, not just the women in the map rooms and stuff, but you have people who weren't really even involved in the front line of things on farms out in the countryside who were responsible and instrumental in apprehending uh, many of the Lutwafa who had landed and um, had safely uh, managed to remove themselves from their downed aircraft. So this Battle of Britain really was a, a point where everyone came together, men, women, children, old, young alike, fighters, non-fighters, this truly was Britain's battle and everyone was involved. What if the Battle of Britain had been lost in the sky? Would that have been game over? Of course it would, because there's nothing then to stop the advancing German forces. Yeah. You know, uh, and that's what Hitler realised, that he needed to win air superiority over Britain, had to defeat the RAF, and that's why um, one of the crucial battles uh, in the war actually took place on the 13th of August 1940. Uh, this is when the Luftwaffe uh, um, launched their main uh, offensive of actually targeting airfields and communication centres because they realised this was the best way to actually defeat the RAF um, by destroying the airfields. And uh, they're of... They, they outnumbered um, the RAF, um, you know, mm. almost triple the amount of aircraft compared to what the RAF had. Uh, but the advantage that the RAF had was, was to have the Hurricanes and the Spitfires, and the Hurricanes would go after the slow German bombers like the Junkers, and uh, the Spitfires would then concentrate on the German Messerschmitts 109s and the other fighter planes to take them out. So um, incredible his, uh, um, uh, feat of engineering in mm. those planes. But, you know, the Germans make fantastic cars so the you know the uh, German aircraft particularly the 109 uh, Messerschmitt was very fast very maneuverable um, and also you, you were up against pilots that had uh, experience mm. um, they, they were involved in the, the uh, invasion with Poland and then the fight against uh, the Dutch and the Belgium and then the French so they would be they would be combat ready. They would have vast experience in, uh, in actually flying these aircraft under combat conditions, which is something that uh, the RAF 
did. Mm. Uh, the, uh, pilots had very little experience, so it was always catch up, catch up um, that they were playing. And yet 1,700 Luftwaffe planes were destroyed and there were 2,662 casualties, which if, if you look at that, you, you, if you were to gamble on it, you would say that the Luftwaffe had every chance of victory. The RAF had very, very little chance. And yet, this is where we've seen d divine sovereignty and providence enter. Yes. God is in control. And the nation together, had the battle of Britain been lost, it would have been catastrophic. Yet I do believe the spirit that was displayed in the battle of Britain would have continued um, through to every single man, woman, and child. And as Churchill said, you know, we will fight them um, on the beaches and we'll fight them. I think that would have continued into our towns and cities, into every village and hamlet where um, there would have been an in mass resistance of everyone coming together to defeat this oppressor. And also I think this is plays deep into the psychology uh, of the Brits. Mm. I mean, we're, we're an island nation. We are cut off from the rest of Europe by the, uh, the English Channel. So there's also that feeling of like, no one is going to tell us what to do and no one is mm. going to push us around. So they have that pluckiness and, uh, and the British people are best when they're pushed with their backs up against a wall. Mm. They come out fighting. I mean, we're a war warrior nation um, and wouldn't actually take appeasement either and certainly knew where the answer to pray, and, and, uh, which is important. So should we have a look at this um, original news archive footage of the time? And in the summer of 1940, 80 years ago, this is how our, our, our TV stations would have reported the uh, Battle of Britain. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Those famous words of the Prime Minister will echo down the pages of history. We of the British Empire owe a debt of gratitude to the RAF, which there is little chance of our being able to repay. With brilliant daring, these young men, many of them in their teens, more often than not hopelessly outnumbered by the enemy, went up from scores of aerodromes to fight a ruthless foe who came day after day and night after night to kill, murder and wantonly destroy. Every hour of every day, our gallant airmen were turning the tide of war by their skill, courage and devotion to duty. High up in the heavens, those knights of the air fought and died. Epic combats often beyond the range of our vision. Spitfires and hurricanes challenging each other in deadly combat with the enemy host. These scenes were taken during the actual Battle of Britain. They show in vivid detail the remorseless attack of our fighters in the grim struggle not only for the life of Britain, but the freedom of mankind. If we failed, all failed. There was no Dunkirk in this battle. Back to the drones came the young heroes time and again to refuel and rearm, to snatch a few moments precious breather before winging into the fight again. The murder of the aged, the women and the children was the deliberate aim of the hunt. Nothing was spared. The palace of the king suffered equally with the home of the commoner. Routed by day, the enemy struck desperately in the darkness. In many of our cities, scenes like this were a constant reminder of the terror by night. Nothing was sacred. The great cathedral of St. Paul's was grievously damaged. Our ancient guild hall, pride of the city, was destroyed. Take your mind back to those dark days when the king and queen walked through the battered streets, consoling and helping by their shining example. 
Mr. Churchill showed his confidence in our spirit and heartened the people by his infectious courage. Scattered over the shores of Britain lay the best tribute to the valiant men who had clawed down from the skies that enemy legion. Battered wrecks of planes that had brought those arrogant Huns on their errand of destruction. On land, too, the twisted remains of the enemy's vaunted Luftwaffe. Goering's graveyard, they called it. A stirring tribute to the skill of our men and the planes they flew. The high courage of our airmen stood between the Hun and world domination. On many an airfield, the king honoured them for their valour. The king decorated his knights at his palace. Do you recall the magnificent exploits of Flight Lieutenant Nicholson, whose first flight earned him the Victoria Cross? Or the heroism in a burning plane of Sergeant Hanna, the youngest holder of the VC? Or Sergeant Ward, VC, a New Zealander of Bomber Command? Sir Cyril Newell was then Chief of the Air Staff. Today, Sir Charles Portal occupies that high post. Fighter Command is in the hands of Sir Sholto Douglas. Compared with those hectic days of 1940, his machines are vastly superior in number, speed and gunpowder. Today, new hurricanes armed with cannon and machine guns roar across the sky. Other daylight daredevils are the famous hurry bombers, hurricanes with a nice line in Air Force X. Faster and more deadly armed Spitfires. The latest bow fighters, twin engine destroyers, and most powerful of all fighters. When dusk falls, the night birds stretch their wings. On the prowl for the enemy are the ominous but aptly named Defiance. And there are many other types, twin engined and four engined, which scour the skies and attack the enemy whenever and wherever he is found. Coastal command machines protect the shipping near our shores. The nation's lifeblood that ebbs and flows at our ports. Giant Sunderlands roam the seas a thousand miles out. Nearer home range the Lockheed Hudsons on the lookout for enemy raiders and lurking U-boats. Our airmen rate very highly these powerful American machines. Western Europe today, we are taking the offensive in the air. And day after day, bomber crews are briefed and their great machines prepared for raids over occupied territory in Germany. To smash railways, factories, docks and marshalling yards. To blow up supply dumps, cripple harbours and wipe out any other strongholds of the enemy. Young knights of the air set off to win their spurs afresh. Into the dusk and through the long, dark hours. Braving ice and storm, murderous anti-aircraft gunfire, and many other dangers. On their return, can you wonder that they're bucked at the thought of a dangerous job well and truly done? Sweeps by day, too, are other feats of daring in our ceaseless attack on the hunt. Gives us some idea of uh, what it would have been like in the summer of uh, 1940 as the battle raged over uh, over the uh, the skies of this nation. Um, just got a few more emails out. This one is a quite amazing one from Hillary. It says my father was on duty at one of the RAF camps uh, when a man approached him to enter but could not produce a pass. An officer came along and asked my father what was wrong and on telling him, the man was taken away. It turned out he was a German, and consequently, my father was made a corporal and was never sent abroad. A fantastic story. Thank you. I like that one. Uh, this one says... Um Let's read this one out. This one says, uh, great guys, uh, thank you, Simon, for covering the truth about Ireland. Only for Churchill, would, we would be speaking German. Um, I think it's important that, that 
Historically, we, we've got to look at this as it was yeah. at the time during the, uh, during the Second World War. Ireland had only just won its independence in the 1920s, so there was a lot of antagonism about uh, before British control of Ireland. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, well, we, we know a, a lot of hatred uh, directed towards uh, Britain. It would have been very strong. But having said that, there were some very brave and courageous um, men from the Republic of Ireland who saw what was going on and decided to join up with the British to fight against the Germans. They did that in the First World War, they did that in the Second World War. So it's important that we don't brush sure. the entire nation um, being, uh, what was the word? Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, neutral. Yeah. That's right, neutral, because Ireland took a position of neutrality, so did the Swiss as well during the uh, Second World War, but it was the mm. Swiss that was the economy of the, uh, of the Third Reich. And it, honestly, speaking as someone who has dual citizenship in US and UK, I could look and say that the US is equally guilty of um, having many uh, who were very neutral. A lot of that is because uh, there were quite a few with German heritage and German background who were very sympathetic to uh, the Nazis in Canada as well. I saw something this week of um, a memorial in a Canadian cemetery that is actually to members of a particular um, Nazi regiment or something, which I, I found was just shocking. <laughs> I did not know that that would be there. Um, in, in the US, there was this neutrality even up to the point of Dunkirk. They didn't want to really enter the fray, so to speak. But as we saw on one of the videos earlier, that there were um, some Americans who were even taking part in, in the Battle of Britain. Um, one was a 29-year-old who lost his life in the fight. Not only Americans, though, you, you have um, many who were Polish. and Two Polish squadrons. Absolutely. Uh, 301 and three, uh, 302 and 303 squadron, yeah. uh, in which they had the most uh, kills of any... Um, 126. Uh, um, ...REF uh, squadrons. Incredible. Yeah. Because they saw what happened to their homeland. It was devastated and destroyed by the Nazis. They saw what was happening to their families. Mm. And this is the way they, they, they fought back. And also, they didn't fight conventionally. If you want to watch a film Film. There's a brilliant film I can recommend called uh, Squadron 303 that tells the history of the uh, Polish uh, fighter pilots who, who were daring and courageous. And also we owe a lot of gratitude to, to the Poles and the way that they helped fight um, against the Nazis and, uh, and also fought for our freedom. Uh, this, this, this is a great one. This is from Mike. He says, hi, Simon. I share your enthusiasm for Spitfires. I had the privilege of working on one at a restoration company. I'm very jealous. I'm not anywhere near a mechanic, but I would be very, very jealous of this one. Uh, this is from Tommy. said, at the age of eight during the war, I was living with my parents in Lewisham, uh, South London. On the way home from school for lunch one day, a German fighter flew over my, over my head at rooftop height, firing its guns. I had split uh, in the sleeve of my coat with a cartridge case nearby. Mm. The aircraft attacked a local school, killing many. Oh, these, these stories are incredible. Uh, this one says, Our monarch and Winston Churchill recognised that the fight was good versus evil, not just... Um, whilst, uh, some words missing there, uh, shooting it uh, with the guy in the black, but spiritual warfare in the heavenlies. Um, that, um, yeah, so that's a good one. Sorry, there's a few spelling mistakes on that one, so it's hard to read out. Um, but, you know, I think reflecting on why this is so important is because this is really the only real air campaign like it in history. Um, there wasn't another battle like the Battle of Britain anywhere, I don't think, in the Second World War. There was over Malta, I believe, um, and the Maltese stood firm against Nazi aggression, and the, the battle and the, was intense in which the RAF defended Malta. Um, but in terms of that aerial combat, I don't think there's anything like it, and we haven't seen anything no. like it since. And this is where, really, the Royal Air Force came into its own, uh, and this is where legends were made, weren't they? Uh, hundreds of planes in the sky. I mean, you, you, you can look at films, you can see some of the footage that was shown in um, that old newsreel a few moments ago, and th that, that can only come close in, in such a way at capturing the drama 
uh, that was unfolding. This was history in the making, a history on the line, really, where you, you have a whole nation, the last bastion of Christian civilization um, in Europe, fighting for its life, uh, men laying down their lives in these plains, and, you know, the, the figures speak for themselves. God was fully in control and was fully working in and through and, and keeping, protecting, and using um, these incredible and brave young men um, to wage this important fight. I, I pray, and if there are any young viewers or if there's anyone who is watching this who has um, family members who have the younger generation, and let's seek to uphold these historical examples. Let's uh, seek to recover a desire to um, look back at these stories of the past and uh, sort of revive this um, spirit of hard work, of sacrifice, of virtue, of integrity and courage. That's what we need in this country. These are all Christian values um, that leads to a healthy society, whether in time of war or in time of peace. Uh, we've acknowledged that we don't just wage war against flesh and blood. Um, we as Christians, we wage war spiritually. And as part of that spiritual battle, we need um, people of all generations to stand up um, to resist the devil, um, knowing that he will flee. We do that um, by being faithful to his word and developing and increasing in those characteristics um, 1 Peter chapter 2 speaks of. Down to about uh, a minute and, and, and 20 seconds left, so I think we need to sum up. But I think the, why it's so important to remember the 80th anniversary of the uh, Battle of Britain it's because firstly it reminds us of the great sacrifice that was paid for the freedoms that we have today. That's the first thing. Uh, and the second thing is it's a reminder uh, of knowing about history and knowing how we see God's intervention in uh, human affairs. And history after all is his story. Mm. So it reminds us that when we're in peril as a nation, we're in huge difficulty, then we can turn to the Lord and we can ask for forgiveness. We can ask for repentance. We can ask for mercy and redemption. And there is no situation that is not too big that he cannot deal with or confront, but we have to allow him to work out his power and his might and authority to do that. Absolutely. As um, Churchill said, never was so much owed by so many to so few. And uh, we, we can look with gratitude on these who went before us in the past. Uh, Reagan, thank you so much for joining me on this program um, and I want to thank you all for watching tonight's program as uh, we look back at the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Britain that was fought above our very skies for the freedoms that we have today. So maybe take time, reflect on the huge sacrifice that was paid on our behalf and thank the Lord for these brave and courageous men and women who sacrificed their lives for the freedoms we have today. So I want to thank you for watching The Late Show.